Wells Great Provincial Park is located in the central part of British Columbia, Canada. It covers an area of 5,250 square kilometers and is the fourth largest park in British Columbia. The park is open all year round. The park has a rich variety of flora and fauna, as well as famous lakes and waterfalls. This place has charming natural scenery and diverse unique landscapes. It is an ideal destination for camping and vacationing. However, in 1982, a shocking murder case occurred here that stunned the whole country. Although the police spent years investigating and eventually caught the killer and sentenced him to the maximum penalty, there are still unknown secrets behind this case. Next, we will tell you about the Wells Great Park murders. On September 13, 1982, a mushroom picker reported to the police that he had found a burned car on the side of a logging road on the hillside. The logging road was near Battle Mountain Road, about 13 kilometers from Bear Creek, north of Clearwater. The police then arrived at the scene. This was a 1979 Plymouth car that had been completely burned. The driver's seat door was open. The police found a pile of charred bones on the back seat. They later confirmed that these were the bones of four adults, and there were also two children's bodies in the trunk. The cause of death for all six bodies was gunshot. The police quickly identified them as the Johnson family, who had recently been reported missing. On August 16, 1982, Bob Johnson was supposed to end his two-week vacation and return to work at the Gorman Brothers Lumber Company, but he didn't show up. Bob had worked at this company for 25 years. He was diligent and responsible, never late or early. It was very unusual for him not to show up on time, so his colleagues reported him missing to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police on August 23rd. 1982. His colleagues told the police that on August 2, 1982, 44-year-old Bob Johnson and his 41-year-old wife Jackie Johnson took their two daughters, 13-year-old Janet and 11-year-old Karen, and Jackie's parents, 65-year-old George Bentley and 59-year-old Edith Bentley, for a two-week camping trip to Wells Gray Provincial Park. The family was very excited about this long trip and had prepared well for it. The Johnson family planned to camp in a secluded area near the old site of the Bull Creek Prison. Then the Bentley couple arrived at the agreed place, driving their Ford pickup truck converted into a camper. They also had an aluminum boat on the roof of the truck. The place was located 18 kilometers north of Clearwater, next to Bull Creek, and about 15 kilometers from where the Johnson car was found. The police went to the area and questioned and investigated the nearby residents. In the investigation, a local told the police that he had seen the family camping near Bear West. Based on his description, the police searched the area carefully and found six used .22 caliber shells, as well as a well-known brand of beer bottle cap that Bob Johnson had drunk, and unopened beers cooling in the nearby creek. There were also two pointed sticks at the scene, which might have been used by the two girls to roast marshmallows. The police deduced that this was the first crime scene. However, the 1981 Ford pickup truck camper that the Bentleys drove, as well as their camping equipment and boat and other belongings, were still missing. Despite the use of tracking dogs, helicopters, and a large number of police forces to search, finding clues was like looking for a needle in a haystack because of the remoteness of the crime scene. Therefore, the investigation work had been progressing slowly. In April 1983, the media filmed a television reenactment of the murder near the crime scene and broadcast it across Canada. The police hoped that the reenactment would jog people's memories. This move did attract widespread attention to the case. Countless people provided information to the police, totaling more than 13,000 pieces, but there were not many reliable clues among them. In addition, the police specially made an exact replica of a 1981 Ford camper, including the aluminum boat tied to the roof. In May 1983, they drove this camper from British Columbia all the way to Quebec. The police hoped again that people would see it and remember information related to the case. Before the camper arrived at each town or city, the police would hold a press conference to announce its arrival. During this time, the police received more than 1,300 so-called eyewitness clues, but they were all proven to be false news. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police even increased the reward to 7,500 Canadian dollars and printed 10,000 posters. They sent them to police stations and post offices across North America. These actions did great greatly increased the public's interest in the case, but they also increased the police's workload of invalid work. For example, someone saw two scruffy French-Canadian men driving a camper eastward to Quebec, but it turned out to be a vehicle that had nothing to do with the case. Despite this, the police did not give up any information that might be valuable. Finally, on October 18, 
1983, 14 months after the murder, there was a major breakthrough in the case. Two forestry workers found Bentley's camper on an abandoned logging road near Trophy Mountain. The place was about 15 kilometers from the murder scene, about 20 kilometers from where the Johnson car was found, and on the other side of the mountain. The camper had been burned, but it was well hidden. It looked like someone had tried to drive the camper into the canyon, but was blocked by log. The police used a helicopter to pull out the burned camper and transported it to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Crime Lab in Vancouver for further investigation. The camper, which had been burned beyond recognition, did not provide any more clues, but the hiding place was worth pondering. The abandoned logging road was very secluded, and ordinary people did not even know it existed, and it was difficult to get into this area by vehicle because of the rugged mountain roads. The police thought it was likely that a local was involved because an outsider would not be likely to find this remote place. So the Royal Canadian Mounted Police started looking for possible suspects in Clearwater again. They visited the entire community and asked every person in town one by one. Soon the police found a suspect, David William Shearing, who was 24 years old at the time. Someone informed the police that more than a year ago, Shearing had asked how to re-register a Ford pickup truck and fix a hole in it. Shearing's home was only three kilometers from the murder scene. At the same time, the police also learned that Shearing was involved in a hit-and-run case. On November 19, 1983, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police found Shearing at Thumb Mountain, north of Kamloops. He was arrested for theft and was due to stand trial in a few days. Shearing was tall and burly, with a rugged appearance and a criminal record, but Shearing came from a respected family. His father, William Shearing, had been a prison guard and died on March 19, 1982, about six months before the murder. His brother, Greg Shearing, was a police sergeant. Shearing completed a heavy machinery course after graduating from high school and became a forestry worker. Coincidentally, Shearing was one of the first people to be questioned after the investigation began. At that time, Shearing was working working at his farm, which was only about 2 kilometers from the murder scene. When he was questioned, Shearing's .22 caliber rifle was hanging on the wall of his home. Later, when asked why they did not confiscate the gun and test it to see if its shells matched those found at the scene, Inspector Edward Wakefield quoted the description of basic rights. I have no right to enter your house and check your gun just as I have no right to enter Shearing's house. We had no reason to do so. At first, the police led Shearing to believe that the arrest was related to the hit-and-run case. Shearing was interrogated after his arrest. In the long interrogation, when the police mentioned the case of the Johnson family, Shearing inadvertently told Detective Eastham that he had heard that the murder happened near Bear Creek. This information had never been announced to the public by the police. It was at this moment that Sergeant Mike Eastham and Officer Ken Libel were convinced that David Shearing was the culprit, so they tried to gain Shearing's trust, make him relax, and postpone appointing a lawyer, which made him confess to his crime. Shearing also agreed to reenact the crime process, and even handed over the belongings of the victim's family. Crucially, he gave the police a .22 caliber Remington rifle that matched the ballistic of the murder weapon. According to forensic examination, Shearing initially said in his confession that he shot four adults sitting by the fire, then shot two girls sleeping in their tent. Then he put their bodies in their car and drove it to the hillside at night and set it on fire with five gallons of gasoline. He also cleaned up the campsite and then drove the camper to a nearby house, intending to keep it for himself. He said he killed them only for robbery, but later found out that re-registering vehicle information was very difficult. That's why he drove the camper to a secluded logging road and burned it. In addition, Shearing told Eastham that if he was sentenced for this case, he would have something else to say to Eastham. On January 19, 1984, David Shearing waived his right to a preliminary hearing. His trial was originally scheduled to begin on March 5, 1984, but after he waived the hearing, the date was postponed to April 16, 1984. However, on the day that Shearing's trial was about to begin, he changed his mind again. He readily admitted to six counts of second-degree murder of the Johnson and Bentley families in 1982. As part of his plea bargain, Shearing said in a written statement, I came out of the bushes behind the camper and started shooting. I put the bodies of four adults on the back seat of the car and then poured gasoline and lit it. I stood by and watched the burning car. After a while, I went to the tent and shot the two kids and put them in the trunk. Detective Eastham thought that Shearing's confession was fabricated, but at that time, they had to accept Shearing's version of events due to lack of evidence. Chief Justice Harry McKay said, This is an unimaginable event. The killer cold-bloodedly and senselessly killed six unarmed innocents for no reason. My sentence should combine protecting the public and deterring crime. It must take into account public opinion. It must clearly express the public's disgust for this ignorant and vicious act. This case is at the upper limit of manslaughter. The killer did not know the victim nor did the victims provoke him in any way. 
He knew they were camping there, and carefully scouted out the situation. It was a premeditated crime. The killer returned to the campsite with a loaded .22 rifle the next day and committed the crime. We do not know the killer's motive. There are no factors that can improve or mitigate the crime process. The severity of the crime requires the maximum penalty. On April 17, 1984, Judge McKay sentenced David Shearing to six concurrent life sentences with no parole for 25 years. This was the maximum penalty for second-degree murder and also the first time in Canadian history. Shearing did not appeal the sentence. However, what troubled many people was that these sentences were concurrent, meaning that he would have a chance to leave prison after 25 years. This was obviously unreasonable for a ruthless killer. David Shearing's mother, Rose Shearing, was shocked by the news that her son had been arrested and convicted for killing six people. She said, I wish this was a serious mistake or a nightmare. He has always been a good boy. He always worked hard. He is an important part of my life. Shearing's brother, Greg Shearing, said, I have many questions to ask the police who investigated this case. I find it hard to believe this because it is unfair to David. After Shearing was convicted, Royal Canadian Mounted Police Chief Mike Eastham reinterrogated him and learned the disturbing truth behind the killing. Eastham said, You know why I'm here, David. I think you assaulted those girls before you killed them. You told me a while ago that after you were sentenced, you would consider telling me what happened. Well, I'm here now. Shearing told Eastham that his motive for killing was not robbery. He had a strong interest in young girls, but he had to kill their parents and grandparents first. He saw them when they were camping and spent several days watching them. He liked Janet and Karen very much and kept fantasizing about them. On the evening of August 10, 1982, he walked into the campsite with a rifle and cold-bloodedly shot Bob Johnson, then Jackie, George and Edith. The two girls were already in their tent ready to sleep. The gunshot scared them. Shearing came to the tent and told the girls that there was a group of dangerous people nearby. He told them to hide in the tent and that their parents had gone for help. The girls believed Shearing's words. After Shearing dealt with the four bodies, he returned to the tent. Shearing told Eastham that he did not kill the two girls then, but kept them alive for almost a week. He stayed with the two girls at his ranch and a small fishing hut on the river near Clearwater. There, Shearing assaulted them. During that time, he was almost discovered. A prison guard was supervising local prisoners fishing by the river. They were very close to the fishing hut, so Shearing prepared to leave the hut. He hid the girls behind the door and told them to be quiet, but the prison guard did not notice anything unusual. The next day, Shearing took the younger daughter Karen to the woods and killed her. The next day, he repeated the process with Janet. Then he put their bodies in the trunk of Johnson's car and drove it to a secluded place and burned it. To verify the truth of this narrative, Officer Ken Libel walked through the bushes to the fishing hut that Shearing had mentioned. Shearing told Ken that he had carved the first letter of Janet Johnson's name there. Ken found JJ there. Shearing was not lying. Ken said in an interview 25 years after the murder, If the family had not met Shearing, those two little girls might have settled down by now. Shearing knew he was infamous. He now uses his mother's maiden name Innes, hoping people will not remember him. In 1995, David Innes, who was in prison, married a woman from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, Heather Innes. Heather thought her husband deserved a second chance. She said, Since I met him, I have seen so many changes in this man. I know this person is not a bad person. I support him. In September 2008, David Innes applied for parole 24 years after he was convicted of murder. At the parole hearing, Heather Innes sat beside him. He said they had a good marriage. When David was asked if he had anything else to add, David took out a yellowed piece of paper with folds on both sides. The paper looked very old. The parole board members were surprised. Shearing read aloud his first public apology in 25 years. My crimes are a huge, cruel and unforgivable tragedy that caused irreparable damage to the community that I can never make up for. It makes me hate myself. Outside the prison gates, relatives of the Johnson family said, The apology is meaningless. We don't want to hear him say anything, whether he really regrets it or not. In the end, the National Parole Board ruled that he still had violent tendencies and had not completed psychological treatment for crime, so he was not ready for freedom yet. For years later, in 2012, David applied again and was rejected again. Retired Detective Eastham submitted a petition with 13,258 signatures to the National Parole Board, hoping that they would reject David's parole application. Then David applied again in 2014, but withdrew his application a month before the hearing. Meanwhile, online and newspaper petitions received another 15,358 signatures urging the parole board not to release this demon. Mike Eastham and Ian McLeod of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who handled this case, retired and have been working to prevent David from being paroled ever since. He said his work is not done as long as David is still alive. The two also co-authored a book called The Seventh Shadow, which describes the investigation 
investigation process of this case and the truth behind it. David Innes is currently being held at Bowdoin Institution south of Red Deer City in Alberta province at age 63.